Hello and welcome to your first skeletal lab list lecture. What we're going to do is go through the bones of our upper limb. So use that handout that I have posted on Blackboard and also hand it to you in class to follow along. So we are going to start describing the pectoral girdle. And I'm going to actually bypass the slide real quick. What your pectoral girdle is made up of is this clavicle bone right over here along with the scapula, which would be found more toward the posterior uh, portion of your body. So let's start off with the clavicle. Oh, there we go. So we have a superior surface here and inferior surface. On these views, we're going to see the acromial end, which will be more of a flattened type of end as far as this portion in here. Uh, so it looks pretty flat right now, the way we're viewing it. Whereas the other end, the sternal end, um, I know I have flat there. The reason I'm saying this is flat is because this end, this portion here is flat because it is going to butt up against your sternum right over here. So it's flat in that sense. But the rest of this portion in here is a little bit more round and you'll see the difference um, pretty clearly in lab. The other structure that we can see is the conoid tubercle here. Anytime you see this word, so you might want to start a list of terminology that we'll be using for our bone markings um, and you can add tubercle to your list. Anytime you see tubercle, that means a sharp bump. So we see this sharp bump right over here, and this enables us to be able to tell a right clavicle from a left clavicle. So this clavicle has to be pointed inferior and posteriorly. So I'll show you this in lab. Um, and the other thing we have to do to tell a right and left uh, clavicle from one another is making sure that our acromial end is facing laterally and our sternal end is facing medially. So again, more on this in the cadaver lab, but there is our sternal end meeting up to the sternum and the acromial end, which is named so because it is meeting the acromion, which sits right behind this arrowhead here, acromion of the scapula. So moving into the scapula, our scapula is really in the shape of a triangle. So we have three sides and three corners or angles. So our first border that we'll talk about is this medial or vertebral border. We call it the vertebral border because lying right here in between your shoulder blades, you would see the vertebrae. So this is something that we can palpate on ourselves. So when we're in the cadaver lab, will of course see all these different structures on the actual cada cadavers, but we can also palpate them on one another. The other border we have is the lateral or axillary border. And of course this is on our lateral side, but also it's heading toward the armpit. This bone over here is the humerus, which is the bone found in the arm. So again, headed to the armpit region, which would be right here, the axilla. And lastly, we have the superior border, which would be the superior most border. Next, we have our three angles. So we have our superior angle here, which is just at the superior most point. We have our lateral or acromial angle. We call this acromial angle because this here is our acromial process or acromion process, which we'll get to in a minute. So that's why it has that name. And also it's found the most laterally. And lastly, we have our inferior angle, of course, because it's the most inferior. Now we have our two processes. So first we have our coracoid process, and this means crow's beak. So if you can kind of compare this to a crow's beak, that's exactly what it looks like. And a process, you can add this to your list of terminology, that really means an outgrowth of bone, an outgrowth of bone. So you could see this with the acromion or acromial process. This too is an outgrowth of bone. Now we're looking at the scapula in a posterior view. And if you feel your shoulder blade, okay, um, a little on the upper third, you're going to feel this spine of the scapula all along in here. 
and that really divides out two depressions. We have your, oh, these are colored wrong. Okay, well, let me pause this and correct it so there's no confusion. Okay, back to this. So that spine of the scapula, if you feel above that ridge, you are gonna hear your supra spine, you're gonna feel your supraspinous fossa. Now add fossa to that terminology list because fossa, sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Fossa means a shallow depression. And that's exactly what this is, just a shallow depression. Later in Anatomy 2, we're gonna learn that the supraspinatus muscle sits within this fossa. And then below the spine of the scapula, so now you're feeling for that spine again, and going below it, you're gonna have a shallow depression here, and that is called the infraspinous fossa. Next, we're gonna look at an anterior view of our scapula, and you can easily tell whether you're looking at an anterior view of the scapula or a posterior view. If you're looking at a nice smooth surface with no spine of the scapula, you know that you are looking at an anterior view. So on this anterior view, you will find the subscapular fossa. Again, we have a shallow depression. And if we break down the words here, sub meaning below, scapular meaning scapula, this is below the scapula if you were lying in the prone position. Let's go back over here. If we break down supraspinous fossa, supra means above, Spinous is referring to the spine of the scapula, and fossa means a shallow depression. So this is a shallow depression above the spine. You could do the same with infraspinous fossa. Infra meaning below, spinous meaning spine, and fossa meaning a shallow depression. So this is just a shallow depression below the spine. So if you're already feeling overwhelmed with all the terminology you have to know, if you break down these words from your medical terminology that you took last quarter, you should be um, you should at least have an idea of where these structures are. Now the next structure is called the glenoid fossa or cavity and it's just a little shallow depression um, at this end over here where we're going to have an articulation or form a joint with the head of the humerus. On this glenoid fossa we also have two tubercles. Now do you remember what tubercle means from our terminology list? It means sharp bump. So if we break this word down, supraglenoid tubercle, supra means it's above the glenoid process and it's a bump there. And here, oh my colors are totally off, this should be orange. This infraglenoid tubercle is a bump below the glenoid fossa, okay? Sorry about that, I don't know why that's happening. Okay, let's move to our next slide. This is just a different view of our scapula. We are now looking at it laterally. So we've basically removed the humerus, that arm bone, and you could see your glenoid fossa here. Here you would have your supraglenoid tubercle, and here you would have your infraglenoid tubercle. Again, mismatch of color, but we'll just quickly correct that. All right. All right, so let's move on into our humerus. And I'm only showing you a proximal view of the humerus, um, but we'll see a distal view in a moment. So when we look at our humerus, you see this spherical portion of it, and that is our head of the humerus. Remember, that is forming the shoulder joint along with that glenoid cavity of the scapula. Now, you'll see these two dotted lines here. We have one up there and one below. This is a natural um, constricted portion below the head of the humerus. So we're gonna call this the anatomical neck. Whereas this more constricted portion, a little more inferior on the humerus or a little bit more distal on the humerus, we're gonna call that the surgical neck. And that's because this is the most common site where breaks occur in the humerus. There we see, next we see the word tubercle again, which means sharp bump. So we call these the lesser and greater tubercles. 
greater because it's larger, which will be more laterally posterior, and your lesser tubercle will be more anterior. Now each of these tubercles create a crest moving on down. So it's a little bit difficult to see in this 2D mode that we have going on here, but we'll be better able to see this in the cadaver lab. And there's our crest of the lesser tubercle. Crest, you can add this to your terminology list, it's more like a ridge. So from that bump, we get a ridge that's created. And if we have two ridges, one with our greater, one with our lesser, we are going to have a groove created in the middle here. So we call this the intertubercular sulcus. Inter meaning between, tubercular referring to our tubercles, and sulcus meaning groove. So this is the groove in between the two tubercles and their crest too, but that's not in the name. Now the last part we can see here is our deltoid tuberosity. Now this word tuberosity looks very similar to tubercle, but it's a little bit different type of a bump. This is more of a perforated, rocky type of bump. Um, and I'll show you the difference in lab. And it's called the deltoid tuberosity because our deltoid muscle, which I'm gonna jump to this picture to show you what the deltoid muscle looks like. The deltoid muscle here moves on down and inserts into that part of your humerus. So it's right down in this region. If we jump back to that image, let's see, over here, you can see it's in a similar location. So deltoid muscle would be right in this region, inserting right there at the deltoid tuberosity. Now we have our distal portion of our humerus. So a lot of people get um, these terms, epicondyle, supracondylar ridges, and condyle mixed up. So I'm going to kind of clarify it for you. Actually, let me look at my next. Okay, I think I took this one out of your list. But I'm going to explain it anyway. So I'll have to erase this in a moment. Let's see what color don't we have there. I'm going to use yellow. So you'll see these dotted lines here at the distal portion, and this is dividing out our lateral condyle. So that's all of this portion I'm kind of coloring in yellow. Separating our lateral condyle from our medial condyle. So all of this portion is known as the medial condyle. Now, on our medial condyle, and lateral condyle, we have other structures listed here that we can find within those condyles. And add this to your terminology list, condyle means knob, like a doorknob. Okay, so let me see how to get rid of this. Okay. So on these condyles, we can also have epicondyles. Epi means upon or on. So this is just a mark on the condyle. So I've zoomed in here for you to see a little bit better. Here's our lateral epicondyle, and this is our medial epicondyle. Um, the reason I know the difference between medial and lateral is one, if you go back to the entire humerus, you'll see that the head of the humerus is always facing medially, so that's your medial epicondyle, but also your medial epicondyle is always larger than your lateral epicondyle. If you feel your elbow on the two sides, you'll feel that bump sticking out, and that is your medial epicondyle. Now above this area, we have your lateral supracondylar ridges, so they're kind of above the epicondyles and along the condyles. So this would be your lateral supracondylar ridge and this would be your medial supracondylar ridge. Now between your medial epicondyle and your trochlea, which we'll get into in a moment, we are going to find, and this is a posterior view of it as well, we'll find your groove for the ulnar nerve. So let me point this out on this anterior view for you. Your groove for ulnar nerve would be right over here. It kind of hugs around this medial epicondyle and it wraps around posteriorly. 
So this is where your ulnar nerve is coursing. And when you hit your funny bone, you are compressing your ulnar nerve that courses through this groove against your medial epicondyle. Next, we have your radial fossa, and this is found on your lateral condyle. It's just a little depression, shallow depression, where the head of the radius is going to move into. And next to it, on the medial condyle, we will have your coronoid fossa. And this is where your coronoid process on your ulna, which we'll get to in a minute, is going to articulate with when you have your elbow inflection. Okay, your forearm inflection at the elbow, more correct way of saying it. Below these fossa, we have two other structures. We have your capitulum, which is nice and round. The word capit always refers to head. So right here, we have a head-shaped structure, and that's why it was named so. The head of the radius will rotate around the capitulum and articulate with the radial fossa. Whereas on our medial side, this is our trochlea, and the trochlea was named after spool, so this term means spool. Um, I always think it looks kind of like a bow tie, and when you wear a bow tie, you choke someone. So troke, choke, I don't know. It makes sense in my head. Um, hopefully it does for you too. So anyway, this trochlea is found on that medial condyle, and the ulna is going to rotate around this trochlea, and that coronoid process of the ulna will articulate with the coronoid fossa. Okay, this is getting a little wordy, but once you practice using these terms, it'll just roll off your tongue. Now, we will, when we look at a posterior view of the distal humerus, we see a big, shallow depression here, and that is known as the olecranon fossa. And this, too, is going to allow the ulna to rotate around this trochlea, and we will have the olecranon process articulate with the olecranon fossa. And that olecranon process is your elbow. So if you're touching your elbow right now, that's the olecranon process on your ulna. And when you extend your forearm at the elbow, so I want you to um, extend your arm out to touch the screen, that olecranon process is moving into the olecranon fossa. And here's what I'm talking about. We have pictures of the radius and ulna here. So this radial head is going to rotate around the capitulum, make contact with the radial fossa, and our coronoid process and our ulna will rotate around the trochlea and make contact with our coronoid fossa. And if we look at a posterior view, you see this arm is in extension at the elbow, so we have the olecranon process making contact with our olecranon fossa. So let's look at these bones in detail. First we'll look at the radius. This hockey puck disc shaped structure up here is the head of the radius. The constricted portion below is the neck of the radius. radius. And below that area we'll see a roughened perforated bump and this is a radial tuberosity. If we look below, we'll see on our radius that there is a little notch here, and this is called the ulnar notch of radius. So this notch allows what we'll soon learn as the head of the ulna to articulate here with the radius. And lastly, we have, oh, and this is a close-up of that ulnar notch of the radius. Um, and lastly, we have the styloid process of the radius. And if you remember, I don't know if this is before your generation, but before there were these smartphones, there used to be palm pilots that people would use um, to jot down notes or um, have a calendar, and they would use a pen-like structure called a stylus. And that's what they used to call pens back in the day, a stylus. So it's this pointed pen-like structure here on the radius. On our ulna, it's interesting because the head of the ulna is on the opposite side. So if you have any siblings, maybe you did something similar, but whenever we went on vacation or had sleepovers, my sister and I would share a bed. And in order to gain more room, we would always think, oh, it's better if you put your head on one side of the bed, I put my head on the other side of the bed, but then you have the issue of kicking each other in the face. <laughs> but anyway, 
So that's what's happening here with the radius and ulna. They're siblings and they're having a sleepover. So here's the head of the radius and on the opposite side we have the head of the ulna. Now if we look at this proximal portion, we have this olecranon process and coronoid process. And this almost looks like a snake opening up its mouth to me. So I always think of the lower jaw as being that coronoid process and the upper jaw being the olecranon process. We also have a radial notch of the ulna. Oh, I skipped that one. Let's see, my animations are off. There's my radial notch of the ulna, and this time this is more proximal. So there's a little scoop here that allows the head of the radius to make contact and articulate with the ulna. This other structure in blue is perforated, and that is called our ulnar tuberosity. You can see that it looks very similar to our radial tuberosity over here. Okay, And lastly, we have the styloid process of the ulna, which is also a pen-like structure, and this can be palpated as well. Okay, now we get to our carpals, which are in the wrist. We have eight carpal bones, and we list them on a proximal row and a distal row. Now I have this mnemonic here that is used by almost every medical school. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. A little racy there. But each of these letters stand for one of the carpal bones. So some is for scaphoid. I almost picture like a little S in here and um, it's quite a large carpal bone too so it stands out. Next we have lovers for lunate. Lunate is referring to a moon. So this is kind of uh, like a crescent moon. If you were to remove this out of these carpals you would see a crescent moon shape. Next we have triquetrium or triangular and this is triangle in shape if you take this um, out of articulation. And lastly in this row, we have the pisiform bone. Um, and that you can palpate as well. I will show you how to palpate this in lab. And this is also a sesamoid bone. That means that it is encased in tendon. Um, so it kind of sits up a little bit more than the other carpals. In our distal row, we have trapezium. I remember this one because I always think trapezium is by the thumb. So this is digit number one, which would be our thumb. Next, we have trapezoid, which is shaped like a trapezoid. Less, uh, second to last, we have captate. And remember, capit means head. So this looks like a little head. I think of a little skull in here, and it's the largest of our, all of our carpal bones. And lastly, we have hamate, which has a very distinctive hook to it. Let me get rid of the shaning. A little hook to it, so that stands out as well. So those are your eight carpal bones. If we look beyond that, we can see our metacarpals. And our metacarpals, we, can, uh, we have sitting kind of within the palm of your hand or the dorsum of your hand. Um, we do have muscle in this area too, so you can feel these metacarpals better on the dorsum of your hand. So each of these metacarpal bones, one, two, three, four, five, is broken down into a base, body, and a head. Beyond that, we have our phalanges. So um, before I get into this, we have three different types of phalanges. So I want you to focus in on one finger here. So this would be our proximal phalange, this would be our middle phalange, or intermediate phalange, and this would be our distal phalange, okay? So each of these two have a base, body, and head. Base, body, and head, base, body, and head. So there's proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, and distal phalanx. Notice how digit number one does not have a middle phalanx, okay? So here would be the base of a proximal phalanx, a body of a proximal phalanx, and a head of a proximal phalanx. So the way that I could ask you this on your practical exam at the end of the quarter, I will have a hand bone there, mark a structure like I did here, and I'll have this listed out for you and you have to fill out the blanks. So the blank of the blank phalanx of the blank digit of the blank hand. So we would fill this in with 
first we have to look and see is this a base body or head so you always start small and build big so base body head this is a head so we would put head there of the blank phalanx so we have to figure out is this proximal middle or distal phalanx this is proximal middle and distal so we would put proximal there and figure out what digit it is this is our second digit okay and then lastly this is the right hand okay so that is it for your skeletal lab list one screencast let me know if you have any questions and i will see you in the cadaver lab on thursday